Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Every time it rains, lots of water washes off your roof. With a rain barrel, you can catch that water and use it to water your garden. Also, there are a lot of bugs that want to eat your trees. We'll let you know what to do to keep them off. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Tanya Ashworth. Tanya is our local garden expert. Okay, And Mr. D is here. Glad to be here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, Tanya, rain barrels. So let me ask you this first. Why do we need to install a rain barrel? Well, a rain barrel is a great water conservation tool. Um, it allows you to capture all the runoff or some of the runoff mm -hmm. coming off of your roof when it rains and save it for uses around your home, okay. such as um, filling bird baths, washing your car, or my favorite <laughs> way to use it, watering the plants around my yard. Sure. Okay, now can you walk us through the process of installing a rain barrel? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We can do that. Um, first, um, I wanted to tell you how much water you can sure, catch, sure, yeah. if that's okay. okay Did you know fine. that the average Tennessee roof has 30,000 gallons of water coming off of it every year? That's a lot. That's a lot of water. And this is only a 55-gallon drum. And I would say, if you're going to install a rain barrel, get the largest one that you can. Okay. Because if you have a 1,000-square-foot roof and you get a one-inch rain, mm -hmm you're going to have something like 623 gallons of water coming off of your roof. Wow. Of course, one rain barrel is going to service probably a quarter of your roof. Right. So the bigger the rain barrel, the better. The better, mm -hmm. right. Oh Absolutely. That's a lot of water you think about it that comes off your roof. It is a lot of water. So what's our average rainfall amount here in Shelby County? Would you know 47 that? inches in Tennessee is our average rainfall. Okay. So you're going to have a lot of water. You'd be surprised. I have a rain barrel at my house. It's very similar to this that I put together. And I'm telling you, five minutes, it's full in a rain. <laughs> yeah. So wow. It catches okay. the water fast. Yeah, because we have some uh, pretty uh, violent rain events. And, you know, the rain comes out pretty, pretty tough here. Yeah, so. yeah. Wow, okay. And, you know, actually, the problem would be when you know we're going to have uh, a lot of rain coming, um, you want to open up the spigot on the bottom okay. and maybe use a ooze hose or a... a a water hose to direct the water um, away from your foundation oh, because you'll have this will fill up so fast yeah. that you'll have more than you can handle. Sometimes we know that we're going to have a large rain event and right. sometimes we don't. So okay. that's a good thing to do too. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. So if to get our rain barrel going, first you have to have the barrel, <laughs> uh, a nice uh, food grade barrel, a good quality, and then you have to cut the hole in the top. I would say at least a four inch hole. Um, you can uh, use a, um, a hacksaw or something like that to do it, or you can buy this uh, hole salt bit that okay. goes onto your electric drill. Mr. Dennison is going to be our <laughs> tool person yeah. today, our assistant, and he is going to drill our holes. But this is going to be the hole where um, the gutter is going to be directed. Okay. So. It's a tool guy. So go ahead. Are we ready? I think so. I if you want to cut ready. a hole. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we got power. I'm probably going to turn around here. And I'm going to put my glasses on. Put your glasses on. on. Mm -hmm. That's right. For safety and I can actually see now. <laughs> Voila. All, All right. right. How about that? Great job. <laughs> How about that? That circle is as straight as the line that, that was, was laid drawn. there. How about that? <laughs> that is awesome. All right. So um, to finish that off, uh, one thing you would need to do is get a piece of um, metal mesh and just cut a little piece with 10 snips which is super easy to do at home, and then just screw it down mm -hmm. because this is going to keep things like leaves and acorns and all that stuff that's coming off your roof, keep it out of your barrel. So okay. you want a way to, a way to filter the water sure. that's coming, coming out. Um, the next thing that we need to do is put in our hose bib, and uh, this is a 
three quarter inch spigot hose bib, but you have to use a one inch drill bit mm -hmm. to drill the hole because you have to have a little room to get it in there. And you can use Teflon tape to make it watertight. So you just wrap your little Teflon tape around uh, the threads there and then thread it in after the hole is drilled out. You're gonna put your hole on the opposite side of where your, um, your downspout's gonna go here. So, and you want your spigot to be maybe three or four inches off of the bottom so that you can get your water in bucket or your watering can under there. Now, a rain barrel this size is not gonna have enough water pressure to run like a hose. You're not gonna walk around your yard with a hose, <laughs> right. you know, water and stuff like this. Is, this is mo mostly for hand watering and things like that. So, um, you want me to mark the spot? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to say maybe there. X marks the spot. Okay. okay. All right. I may need some help holding this, okay. Chris. Yeah, we can do yeah. that. See, we want to hold that. Huh? See what we got here. <laughs> now we're ready to put in our uh, our spigot. So we just put Teflon tape around mm -hmm. it. You can also use caulk um, mm. instead of That's the Teflon right. tape. I'm not a plumber. Be good. Well, you look like you might have done it a time or two. Hmm. I'll see what happens, huh? Now we'll see. Put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> One more? Yeah, it'll go, I think. Won't work for it. No. <laughs> <laughs> right there? All right. How about that? That's All right. a great job. Good deal. I set it up. Thank you so much. Mr. D is handier with tools than I am. Oh, he's good. <laughs> so there we go. It's all we would have to do is add the mesh to the top and then um, for your gutter, you're going to want to make sure that you get, um, it's a flexible piece that connects the downspout to, um, to aim it mm -hmm. over your hole. Um, you may be wondering, well, what about mosquitoes? Right. If I have um, standing water in my yard when I have mosquitoes. And you will have mosquito larvae in your rain barrel, but yes, they make a will. product for that. It's called Mosquito Dunks. And um, they contain BT, which is an organic, uh, pesticide and it's totally safe. You can still use the water for your bird baths. Your cat or dog can drink out of the water. It won't hurt anything but your mosquito larva, but it kills mosquito larva. And you're probably wondering, after I screw down that, that mesh screen, how am I going to get this in here? These are very crumbly, so you just take maybe half a dunk and crumble some in there and that's all you have to do to keep the, the mosquitoes out of your rain barrel. Okay. And then the last thing I wanted to make sure I told you, you're going to want to raise your barrel off the ground because um, the higher off the ground, the better the water pressure you're going to have. Now, these thing, this thing's going to be heavy when like it's that. full. Mm -hmm. um, you want to use like uh, concrete cinder blocks. That's what I've got mine on at home. And make sure it's level. Make sure it's secure. Because when this thing is full, the water water's very heavy. It's yeah. going to weigh about 450, 460 pounds. Wow. So um, make sure that you think about if you have small children. and um, Small pets. Yes, yeah. that they can't knock it over. Right. So. All right, so this is our rain barrel. Yeah. And actually, you could probably paint this if you wanted to. Oh, yeah, and, you know, a lot of people Put some design do. on mm -hmm. it or something like mm -hmm. that. I think it'd be pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Maybe camouflage, you know? Or camouflage. Yeah, you could, <laughs> yeah. And you know, if you're worried about it being an eyesore big plastic barrel, put it on the in the backyard, you know, around the back of the house and let it service a, you know, a fourth of your roof back there, so. All right, Tanya and Mr. D, yeah, how to a guy. You. We definitely appreciate that demonstration. I hope the folks appreciate that as well. Mm -hmm. All right.
one of the common diseases that you might see on your tomatoes, in fact, most people do in most years, is going to be early blight. And we do have a little bit of example here. Now, it's going to be more common for us to see it on the older leaves and oftentimes a target spot. Um, so we're seeing some brown necrotic area, then some yellow around it. Now, certainly there are other leaf diseases, so if you're uncertain, you can get a lab sample. But, um, but this would be a really good example of, you know, kind of early stage, early blight in the garden. And so lots of times, if you just see a little bit, you can actually remove that leaf. Sanitation addresses that by removing some of the inoculum so you don't infect some of the rest of the plant. However, you can also spray with a variety of conventional as well as organic fungicides. All right, Mr. D, tree bugs. Yeah, we got some right here in front of us. Yeah. Yep. Bagworms, let's talk about bagworms okay. first. We let's have three, three little cocoons right here. Uh, you know, if you see those right now, uh, they're done. They've already, they, they, they are pupated and, and there's one generation of bagworms per year and, and they hatch out in you know, mid to late May, early mm -hmm. June and that is really the only time you can do anything about it. So if you got that problem right now, just pick off the ones you can reach and, and because that will do some good because these things are gonna, they'll, uh, actually they'll overwinter as eggs in one of these pouches, you know. And, and if you happen to pick off the, the pouch that has the eggs, it's full of eggs, then you'll help, help your population next year. Yeah, and that was about 300 eggs. In each. Yeah. Pouch. Each pouch, yeah. wow. or 300 cocoon. or more. Um, but just keep in mind, if you if you had a problem this year, you're going to have a problem next year probably. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so go, and you're you're going to have to treat before you see the problem next year. I mean, when the uh, caterpillars are really small, they're easy to kill with BT. Bacillus thuringiensis is one of the best products to use. Late May, if you spray the trees that you've had a problem with. And BT is a product that you can use in a hose-in sprayer. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you just want to, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a, it's a bacteria and you just want to get it up in the tree where when the caterpillars feed on it, it'll give them a very, very bad stomach ache and they'll die. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing on the bagworm. Not a whole lot that you can do now, but except maybe pick a few of them off if you can reach them. Okay. This is the fall webworm and it's not even fall yet. <laughs> yeah, it's not fall. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, these things, these ought to be called summer, fall Should webworms, be. I guess. But uh, classic, classic web, uh, always out on the end of the branches. Uh, also, the BT product, the same product that we talked about uh, killing uh, uh, the bagworms will also do a pretty good job on, mm -hmm. on the fall webworms. They're unsightly. Uh, they're not going to kill the tree. Uh, they really, really like pecan trees. What kind of tree is that on? I can't, there's not enough leaves left. It's a peach tree. That's a peach tree. They yeah. like fruit. They like ornamental mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, p uh, fruit and nut trees they, they really like. Yeah, that peach tree is actually out of my yard. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you're, and the tree's still alive, isn't it? It's still alive. Yeah, it's still alive. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, really not a whole lot to worry about. I, I do know that all winter long, I've got a lot of pecan trees in my, in, in my house, and all winter long these webs will It'll fall off, and yeah. they'll, you know, you'll have a big mass of, of webs and leaves, and that'll fall off every once in a while on the ground. They'll be scattered around, but my lawnmower, the mulching blade, does a good job of chewing <laughs> as I'm chewing up the other leaves. I usually just open that up and, and let the birds come in and do their, mm -hmm. do their job. They, they like yeah. the, the caterpillars, and that, that is a defense mechanism uh, because it's hard for a bird to get in there. A bird's not going to try to tear into that uh, on its own, yeah. but if you help them a little bit, they'll they'll get in there and, and eat them. How many generations are we talking about? You I know? think there's three generations okay. per year on, on the fall webworm. Uh, unlike the eastern tent caterpillar, which only has, you know, the early spring, right. uh, it only has one generation per year. But I think there are three generations of the fall webworm per year. Starting in, starting early, you know, in June yeah. and, and, and going through, through the fall. Yeah, I've seen a lot out now, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. All right, any more tree bugs out there that we need to uh, know about? You know, for our ornamentals or fruit trees. You know, uh, uh, probably aphids on pecans yeah. and, and, and some of the maple trees are will, will be secreting honeydew and there'll be some sap. You'll, folks say it's sap dripping off <laughs> the trees onto my car and onto my yeah. lawn furniture and all that. It's really not sap out of the tree, it's honeydew out of aphids. 
which is, I guess, indirectly sap. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Run through indirectly. A aphid, and it's really aphid poo poo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that that may, you may be seeing that this summer. But uh, I don't know what kind of calls are you getting at the extension office. Uh, boars, of course. Oh man, that's yeah. a tough one too. Yeah, that's uh, a tough on one. The fruit trees and fruit trees, you know, uh, especially uh, yeah, peach trees. So you know what that is. Peach tree boar. So peach basically, boar. you know, I, I don't know of anything. Uh, if you have a peach tree infected with peach tree boar, you pretty much write it off. Wow. Plant something else after you take that. Yeah, because then time and critical, if you're trying to control the peach tree boar. Exactly. Mid June, early to mid June, mm. you have to keep a protective uh, insecticide coat on that the base of that tree. Spray the base and lower limbs. Isn't it also really bad on your ornamental cherry trees? Is that the same any, insect? Any kind of. Yeah fruit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, peach plum and nectarine especially, but but the ornamental, you know, peach plums and, and, and cherries. Yeah, it and seems like, like everything that. in a prunish genus, mm -hmm. yeah. right. you know, for the most part, your stone right. fruits. Uh, it's actually uh, the adult, you never see the adult, it's a little, looks more like a wasp than, than a moth, but it's a moth that uh, uh, is the adult. and uh, I don't think I've ever seen one out. Well, they, okay. I guess they're nocturnal. And uh, they, um, but you, the only way to con, you know control them is to prevent them, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Only and that's what the commercial guys have to do. Okay, uh, we did get a couple of calls about stink bugs and pecans. Stink bugs and pecans. Uh, two bricks, you know. <laughs> watch, watch your thumbs. Oh, okay. Watch your thumbs, you know. Two uh, bricks. Oh. They're, they're, uh, some of the pyrethrins will, <laughs> when you spray it directly on them, will take them out. But, you know, stink bugs are very strong flyers, and you can kill every stink bug in your yard, and, and they'll fly in from your neighbors. So if you've got a small specimen tree, you can go out there and, and, and treat, because they do, they miss your pecans up. They yeah. have piercing, sucking mouth parts, and they'll stick their proboscis in the, in the, the fruit the soft fruit and they'll inject the substance and then start pulling that will kind of dissolve the inside of that pecan and then they'll suck it out and then that's why the pecan will go on and, and, and it will mature and you'll have little black spots in the fruit and uh, or in, in the pecan meat and uh, uh, won't hurt you to eat it but right. you know I'd prefer not to have the little spots in my pecans. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure most folks would. <laughs> But the only thing is to use one of the pyrethrins uh, to, you know, if you have a small tree that you can spray, but a big tree. Yeah, we'll worry about it. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. D. We have some ground cover here, the Ogon Sweet Flag, and we've got a spot missing. This one has gotten rather large, so we're going to divide it and move it over. So I'm going to get towards the center of this. Got some nice worms. Leave some of this soil here. And we'll move it over here. See, it's a little bit wider. And plant it here. That's good. And then we can water it in to make sure air pockets are out of the root zone. Now it can reside here and improve the looks of the landscape. And all we have to do is fill in the hole where we dug it up. Here's our Q&A session. Tell okay. you, help us out, please. All right. All right. Uh, here's our first viewer email. For the last couple of years, my hydrangeas have been growing well, but they won't flower. I do cut back the previous year's old stalks. They look dead, he says. But my wife tells me that's where the blooms come from. Is she right? What can I do to encourage my hydrangeas to bloom next year? And this is from Mike from Ringgold, Georgia. All right. So, Tanya. Well, Mike, 
Is the wife right? I believe she oh, is. I believe okay. she's right on this one. You need to listen to his wife. Yes. If yeah. you have a, a mop head or a lace cap type hydrangea, your old fashioned hydrangeas, they bloom on old wood. Mm -hmm. um, there are some that bloom on old and new wood. Those are your ever blooming um, hydrangeas, but they're going to say on the plant label when you buy it at the store, yeah. you're going to know for sure that's what you've got. Yeah. And, and um, But most of your common hydrangeas, are they bloom on the old wood. So. I would say don't prune them at all if you can help it, um, but if you've got one that's just, you really need to prune it back, the best time to do it, and there's still no guarantee you're not cutting off some blooms for next year, but the best time is immediately after they flower, um, before they have time to set the, the next year's buds for the blooms. So yeah, um, try not to prune mm. them, but if you do, mm. right after flowering. If you wait till the fall, it's over with, no blooms. Hi, right, Mr. Mike, so the wife, it's right. Yeah. So that's what happened to your blooms. So be careful. All right, appreciate the question. So here's our next question. How do you control scales that are on my magnolia tree? What do y'all think about that one? Any thoughts, Tonya? Well, um, you could use a horticultural oil, uh, maybe a summer oil, because the, you wanna be careful when you use it, when you use horticultural oil, that you don't get leaf burn. That's not something you want to do in 90 degree weather here uh, yeah. in the mid south in the summer. That's right. Unless you, you know, I'd wait till the fall to do that uh, to apply oil because it can burn the leaves, and you may have to apply more than once. Um, or if you use an insecticidal soap, you may be applying several times. Uh, it's not something that's going to be easily controlled by those measures. Mm -hmm. um, or you can use a soil drench. Um, Imidacloprid mm -hmm. is the active ingredient in several products. Uh, you can mix it up in water and just pour it around the base of the tree and it's a systemic so it goes up through the vascular system of the plant so when those scales uh, suck the moisture out of your plant they're getting some of that insecticide mm -hmm. too and that should take care of the scale. It's probably the easiest method and it's very effective, the imidacloprid. And again, the soil drenches are something that we do recommend at UT Extension. Uh, it is in our red books. Uh, so you can use those. Uh, Mr. D, did you want to add anything else I to that? I was just going to say, fortunately, the, uh, the magnolia scale only has one generation per year, and uh, the crawlers are active in uh, July and August, and that would be a really good time to try to kill them. The crawlers are easier to kill than the adult. Mm -hmm. you know. and, and something else, too, and Tanya talked about it a little bit, you have to get good coverage. Mm -hmm. Good coverage. Uh, underneath, you know, up top. I mean, you have to do that if you want to control these uh, critters, that's for sure. All right, so here's our next question. A guy taking care of my lawn hit my five inch maple tree and ripped off a three by five inch hunk of bark. With a piece of bark missing, will I be able to save my maple tree? Oh, Tanya, I see you pondering that. What do you think about that? Possibly, the Possibly, first thing I would says. do okay. is go get a bag of mulch. Okay. And okay. mulch the tree hmm. because it's gonna prevent further damage from the lawnmower. Oh, okay, there you go, okay. I'm and following Keep you. them away from the tree. Yes, it will keep you I'm and whoever you. is- Mulch uh, correctly. Yes. Yeah. Mulch yeah. correctly. That's right. We're talking two to three inch layer, yeah. not piled up around the trunk, but spread evenly around the tree. Um, and that way it's a nice little <laughs> circle. You don't have to worry about a weed eater getting next right. to it or a lawnmower getting next to it. Um, what you don't wanna do is spray over it or the tree will heal itself in mm -hmm. most instances if if not too much if, it, if the cut wasn't too deep the tree will usually heal itself make sure that it um, gets plenty of moisture don't mm -hmm. let it undergo any stress and you could check for some signs you know periodically check to see if there's any insect problems borers getting in sure. there but first thing you want to do is go mulch your young trees is that from experience Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you sounded pretty angry about yeah. that, but I, I do agree, yeah. yeah. It's the old yeah, weed eater blight. And, yeah. yeah, weed eater it's, blight, it's exactly. Weed eater blight and a lawnmower uh, damage. Mr. D, anything to add to that? No. That, well, I tell that, you, Tanya's you you been covering it today, you got it. I tell you. you got it. Um, but, you know, something I will say, too, now, this is, you know, five inch, okay. But underneath that bark is the foam layer, okay. Of course, that takes food to the roots. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that thing starts dying out, you start having leaves falling off that tree, then there's a case that maybe it's not gonna make it. Yeah. It's hard to say without a picture of it. It is, it is. Without knowing how deep the cut is. And it is. Yeah, it's just three to five inch hunk of bark. If yeah. it's 
if it's three inches wide and five inches tall, you have a better chance of it surviving than if it's five, five inches, inches wide right. and, and, uh, on a five inch tree than three inches tall. But I do know trees, for the most part, do a really, really good job of putting a natural barrier between mm -hmm. damaged tissue and, and healthy tissue, and they, they generally can heal up, scab over, and that, that will probably, you'll never know that happened 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but one thing, you mentioned something, uh, trees that are injured like that, that are stressed like that, do tend to attract secondary insects. Oh, yes, they do. Mm -hmm. And so do keep an eye on that, and, and, and you might have to hit it with an insecticide every once in a while if you see something getting in there, boars or something getting in there that ought not to be in there. And it's usually boars. Yeah. yeah right. That's usually when you see the boars. You right. know, they're secondary for the most part. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, especially on your maple trees. So you have to be careful with that, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. So, Tanya, Mr. D, we're out of time. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.